Good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Gian Piero Massolo. I'm the president of ISPI, Italian Institute for Political and International Studies. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar. This is an event that ISPI is very glad to uh, organize together with the Foreign Ministry of Italy with the representation to the Italian representation to the UN and of course with the, our partners of the International Crisis Group. And I wish to welcome and to pay tribute uh, to Ambassador Zapia, our representative to the United Nations. I to say warm welcome and good morning to Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo. And uh, of course to say a warm hello to President Robert Malley of uh, International Crisis Group. Today we are we will be speaking about multilateralism, about what, what it means today, actually. It, it's in the run-up of our flag, of our ISPIS flag event, which is Mediterranean Dialogue. The sixth edition will go uh, on uh, in the next day, starting from November 25th. Unfortunately, this time it will be largely digital, largely from far away due to uh, circumstances that we, that we all know. And uh, actually we are dealing here with about multilateralism uh, with the aim and with the ambition of uh, giving solutions or at least to, uh, to, to, uh, to give some hints about possible for solutions for post pandemic times since COVID is severely testing international, international cooperation. I must say that multilateral is certainly not uh, riding high those times. It's no longer perceived or it seems so by governments and maybe by public opinions as an, official, as an efficient uh, tool to tackle conflicts, crises, global challenges. Uh, I will not dwell on the causes here of this of this kind of, of situation but still i am convinced that although not feeling well uh, they knew about a uh, passing uh, uh, passing away of multilateralism is highly premature as uh, mark twain would have put it and uh, we have the ambition here to uh, to uh, to discuss giving maybe a couple of ideas, a couple of provocations, a couple of possible tracks of, of reflection. Uh, one track, one possible track is that we, it's what I'm going to say, it's pretty obvious, that is we can't simply go back to multilateralism as it was. We have in a way or in another to reinvent it, to take stock of a new situation where no longer states no longer sovereign states are the only stars in the international community, but there are a whole bunch of other stakeholders that in a way or in another need to be involved. And the first question could be, is climate change one possible playing field to reinvent multilateralism? A second set of, of provocations, of tracks of reflections is that the events are on the move. We will have a new we will have, do we? Well, we hope we will have a new American president which will set, uh, I mean, hopefully a completely new tone as far as uh, the way in doing business in international situations of crisis is concerned and maybe coming back to more traditional tools uh, of multilateralism and maybe signaling it's uh, his intention of, of changing how the rules and the rules of the game are by getting back into the uh, uh, Paris Climate Accord. And the second thing that is, that is taking place is that uh, despite all the uh, American initiatives uh, we witnessed, not only with Trump, but also with uh, President Obama before, uh, it's that after all, things are rapidly moving. Look at Asia, uh, in the macro, regional globalization is taking place, it seems. The Asia Free Trade Agreement that has just been signed, you have on the political side a strong rollback of China and then the same countries 
on which the US are counting most to have this rollback signed with China a free trade agreement. Events are on the move. And the third track of reflection could be, and it's consequential to what I just said, but can we still always say that a rule-based world order, a liberal-based new order is still coincidental with US-driven world order? I will stop here. We have an outstanding guest today. I wish to to tribute a warm salute to Enrico Letta, former Prime Minister of Italy, Dean of Sciences Po International School in Paris. And he will be, in a way, interviewed and conversation will take place with him, which will be led by Robert Manley, the Chief of the International Crisis Group. Please, the floor is your yours. Thank you so much, uh, and thank, thank you for the, that, that, that introduction. It's really a pleasure for us to say that to hold this uh, event and uh, this conversation with the Prime Minister, um, who's been a champion of cooperation of multilateralism within Europe and, and beyond. Uh, we at Crisis Group have been involved in, in this dialogue of, of MED in the past in Rome. I, we all, of course, wish we were there in person, but take this opportunity as a, as a real uh, important one particularly at this, at this time. Uh, and you just uh, set out very well what the dynamics are. Uh, and in this conversation with you, uh, Prime Minister, I'd like to raise sort of start from a, 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 a take a step back um, and try to reflect on the moment we're in and how it affects the, the, the what I'd say the tug of war over multilateralism, as Mr. Masoto said, just even in terms of defining who the actors are. At the start of the pandemic, we at Crisis Group uh, felt that um, it was posing a challenge to multilateralism in the following sense, and it could go in two very different directions, two narratives, I'd say. On the one hand, the notion, which seems to be a logical one, that a pandemic, which by definition is a transnational threat, should lead to a global response to more multilateralism, to more cooperation, to confront not just the health pandemic, but the, the consequences of the, the health crisis, but also the economic impact. And therefore you needed to see uh, more, more, more solidarity among uh, countries and non-state actors across the world. But there's the second narrative which preceded COVID-19 and which in some ways one could say was bolstered by it, which is that the pandemic represents a threat from the outside, a threat of globalization, a threat of open borders, and therefore to better confront it, people needed to build walls, and protect from the virus rather than reach across borders to fight uh, uh, against it. And if you look at the last six months, you could see evidence of both in the US, a nationalist narrative under President Trump, building walls, leaving the WHO, calling the virus, the, the, the Wuhan virus, refusing to cooperate on international global vaccine initiatives, US and China global competition, which, uh, which has led to paralysis in the Security Council, and of course, on the other hand, in Europe, in particular, uh, promotion of a more multilateral response, uh, both uh, in terms of the, eco the economic crisis and the health crisis. So I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, as somebody who has been a champion of multilateralism, how do you see it? How do you see that narrative, that battle of narratives unfolding? Where do you see the prospects for multilateralism emerging uh, uh, in the wake of the health crisis and the, un and the ongoing uh, economic one? So, if you could let us, I have a series of questions, but if you could start us off with that one, uh, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to, to thank, first of all, uh, uh, Gian Piero Massolo and Angela Zappia, and of course you, Robert Mallet, because uh, I'm very happy being here with all of you and being able so, so to exchange on these uh, uh, crucial topics in this very period. I. My uh, immediate reaction is the fact that uh, the point that you raise now is crucial because at the end of the day, both trends that you mentioned are true at the same time. So you have uh, a reaction of a part of our people, a part of our establishment, of our nations, of our leadership that is pushing in the direction of more multilateralism, more cooperation, understanding and being completely aware that it is needed uh, to have more cooperation and more multilateral. But at the same time, it is very strong uh, around our countries 
uh, this push, this boost in the direction of walls by saying that, look, here, another demonstration of how bad is globalization, because globalization is bringing bad news or bad virus from countries that are dirty countries or without uh, clean uh, uh, attitudes and, and so on and so forth. And uh, these behaviors, these topics uh, are today so strong in our uh, general discussion. So my point is that uh, this pandemic here, this 2020, at the end of, of this year, we are, we are uh, aware of the fact that the gap is widening. This is my feeling. The gap is widening within our societies. And I, my interpretation of the uh, electoral result in the US, it is linked to this gap that is widening. Because at, at the end of the day, you have, uh, look, the, 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 the electoral result of the US is, is saying what? Is saying that first you had uh, an increase in the participation so more participation. People is very engaged in the political arena today. Uh, a, an enormous polarization, enormous polarization. And uh, uh, I think it's the demonstration of what is happening. And I see the same in Europe. Uh, we, we, we can check exactly the same uh, trends in our European countries where you have uh, a fight uh, between these two different narratives that you very well uh, mentioned. Uh, so um, I, I don't know what, what is the, the, the outcome of this polarization of this gap that is widening. My feeling is that uh, um, we need maybe to think a little bit uh, on how uh, to share with the large part of our population the topic of the cost of the lack of coordination. That is maybe, in my view, the most important topic. I think uh, that one of the outcomes of the, of the present discussions within the European Union, at the UN level, at G7 level, at G20 level, uh, at OECD level, would be the establishment, I frame it, I call it the index of the cost of non-coordination. Uh, because if you have the capability to uh, explain or to have a correct and very, very comprehensible narrative on, of this cost, uh, I think it is easier to be understood by the people because it is clear that there's the feeling, the, the flavor, or the, the, the intuition of the fact that at the end of the day, we had a lack of coordination. We had it in Europe, within the European Union. Uh, I remember at the very beginning of the crisis, all the people saying that, okay, well, what, what the European Union is doing for this crisis, for this pandemic? Uh, without knowing that the European Union was completely uh, empty in uh, uh, her tools on competences on healthcare, on security, on, on sanitary furnitures, and even on social issues. Uh, why? Because in, in the past, because of the vetoes of some countries, the European Union was without competences on, uh, on healthcare, on social issues. But uh, we needed some weeks for the entire people, entire population in our European countries to be aware or to understand that the European Union was without competences on that. But the same was at, at the world level. Why don't we cooperate among countries? The lack of coordination, the lack of cooperation one of, was one of the key issues. So if we are able to build up uh, a system, a ranking, uh, a narrative on this cost or the fact that the lack of coordination has a cost. And this cost is a cost of uh, financial resources and human resources. Uh, it is the loss of lives and loss of money. 
both. And uh, if we are able to, to build up this index, I think the OECD maybe could be the right place to uh, create this index and to try to organize this index. And for instance, I have to say that uh, uh, the Italian government and Italy will lead uh, next year uh, G20. And why don't we uh, launch the idea to create uh, this index in a very formal way at G20 level, uh, asking the OECD uh, to, to be in charge for uh, the concrete organization of this index. I say that uh, a, proposal, a proposal like that can be more successful, more can convince the people more than rather than any discourse of any politician. And because if you have there something that is testified and that is uh, clarified, that is really there, officialized by uh, some uh, uh, non-partisan organizations, I think here we are discussing, we are talking on lives, human lives. So there is more than discourses, it's more than rhetoric. And I think that could be, uh, Bob, one, one, for me, one, one concrete uh, outcome of this discussion in a period in which the widening of the gap is the feeling I have in the present situation. Well, th thank you. I mean, first of all, I want to say, echo what you said about the US election. I think it would obviously be a mistake to purely view this as a victory <clears throat> For, uh, for, 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 for Vice President Biden, as you said, it, it revealed, and I think you put it well, an enormous gap uh, with you know, close to half the population or half the voting population that sees the world through very different eyes. And that's so, to, and, and I, don't, I don't think the Democratic Party has found a way to speak to them in a way that they actually understand and believe. And I suspect that you know, as somebody in your case who's been at the intersection of politics and policy and, and thinking, but also acting, You've seen that in Europe as well. So I want to dig a bit more deeply in this notion of finding a language that could appeal to people who are very skeptical of elites, very skeptical of globalization, very skeptical of abstractions. You speak of an index of, 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 uh, of the cost of the absence of multilateralism, also perhaps an index of the benefits of, of multilateralism. And that's so to be more concrete, um, how do you convince people that multilateralism and you know these words like globalism which have been associated with so many negative things how do you uh, convince them of the benefits of sharing scientific knowledge or sharing economic uh, benefits and pain again putting your dual hats as a somebody who's been in politics and somebody who's reflected about um, about sort of more uh, at a more um, political science level how would you try to bring that to light for people who are been, who've grown so suspicious of the language they hear from people they view as coming from the, the elite? Uh, you know, in my view, there's one topic, one, one uh, fundamental topic is, the, is to say for the people, hey, look the others, what they are doing. Uh, this is why I think, for instance, what uh, Giampiero just mentioned, RCEP, it's a revolution this week. The, the, the last Sunday signature in Hanoi of this agreement that is gathering 30% uh, uh, of world uh, um, and GDP and uh, having 15 countries that are countries sharing a continent, Asia, uh, that is the crucial continent for the future. I think that, for instance, for our Western world. I see it for Europe, I see it for the US. Uh, I'll, I'll try, uh, I would say, for instance, to our people, hey, look, in the moment in which we have to think on how to relaunch our economies, our societies in a post-pandemic world, you have from Asia this kind of response. It's a response based on cooperation, multilateralism, relaunch of exchanges. In the same time, in the same period, you have in Europe uh, the final fight 
around Brexit, so a divorce, a division that is exactly the opposite of what they are doing in Asia. And this divorce will uh, have a lot of uh, problems in these last days, but also in the next future. At the same time, in the US, you have this internal division of the US. That was the most important news in the last, uh, in, in these months of November. Because yes, the news was Biden won and Trump lost. But at world level, at the end of the day, I think the most important news was US divided as uh, never happened. And that is the, I would say, the frame that is shared at world level on the US. I think the, the most important news is US divided, more than US changed, US divided. So at the end of the day, the Western world is divided. The US are divided, Europe is divided because of Brexit and because of many other aspects. So my answer to your question is to say, uh, for instance, today to say to the people, uh, look at the approach that we have. Our approach is uh, looking back. The approach of the, uh, from, from Asia is looking forward. Uh, is, the, is the way to understand the fact that this cooperation among giants is the first time that Japan, Korea and China are on board of the same process. And they did it the day after uh, or the day before the, the, the relaunch after pandemic. I think it's enormous what happened last, uh, last uh, Sunday in Hanoi. And uh, so my, my point is that narrative needs comparison, first of all. And uh, comparison with also using, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but uh, I am out of any official uh, position, so I can, <laughs> I can allow myself to be <laughs> very frank in that. Uh, using also some, some worries, some fears. And the, the worry and the fear is to say, okay, people, uh, we risk to enter in a predominance from China, from Asia, and we risk to be the, 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 the old countries of these centuries in which new countries will take the lead. And the demonstration, what, what is happening today is exactly the demonstration of that. Uh, so my, my point is that uh, narrative needs this comparative aspect and also needs uh, to, to, to use uh, worse scenarios, bad scenarios, and the possibility to compare. This is why I mentioned the index, the index of the non-coordination. That is, in my view, better than the, the index of something of positive. Because... When you have something of positive, you give it for granted. You are not thinking why I have it or can I, lo can I lose it? The key point is, is, the, is, is how is possible to understand what we are missing today and how much uh, the, the, this lack of coordination is costing us in terms of lives in terms of money and in terms of competitiveness. If you, uh, you know, the, the, in the US, I think this China rise uh, is becoming more and more the key issue. And uh, I repeat what happened uh, four, four days ago is exactly the demonstration of, of that in Asia, they are taking leadership and they are using multilateralism to take leadership. So I think we have to um, challenge them on the same ground, the same, the, that, that is multilateralism. And on multilateralism, I think we can use uh, RCEP uh, in, a, in, a, in a very effective way. And uh, at, at the end of the day, what happened also on, on pandemic allow us to use the, the term uh, of, of uh, of effectiveness. 
being alone makes you ineffective. Uh, because the cooperation, for instance, the vaccine, it is so clear that on the vaccine, uh, the only way uh, to have a, an happy end is to have cooperation. I don't care if the vaccine is from Australia, from Bolivia, from the US, from China. I want an effective vaccine. Stop. So this is my point. And uh, using these terms, I think it can be uh, important to to uh, extend this narrative and, and to be very strong also in explaining why multilateralism is not the past, but it is the future. Well, that, that's a great segue to my next uh, question, which is focused on the US and this, this, this uh, battle about multilateralism, defining multilateralism and, and, and defending it. So over the last four years, uh, we've had a phenomenon in the, U in the U.S., which I'm sure is different, but you've lived some of it in Italy and elsewhere with the rise of populism and a certain form of politics, uh, which here has been you know, very much geared towards the notion that multilateralism has served others and America has been sort of bankrolling other countries and, and multilateralism has been a, a process in which America first was ignored and it became America at the service of others. And during those past four years, even as the US retreated to some extent, China, Russia have tried to, to polish their own image as defenders of a different kind of multilateralism, uh, a different kind because they rewrite the rules, they rewrite the values. Uh, how easy do you think it, it will be for, 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 for now President-elect Biden to reverse that trend? Any advice you would have? I understand you're not in an official role, so both of us can be freer, but any advice about how he could do it, to do it in a way that it will appeal both to others around the world, but also to his own electorate, which as you just said, because it's a polarized situation, there are many Americans who are gonna say, we don't wanna go back to the days where the US quote unquote, gave a free ride to others. We wanna benefit from multilateralism and not just be sort of the ones who are always signing checks for others. So how do you reach that balance of the U.S. helping recreate a multilateralism that has appeal to other countries, which are, and there's a competition now with China and, and, and other countries offering their own model, but also appealing to a domestic constituency that has grown uh, very, very skeptical of what they view as an elite form of globalism? Many many points on that. One uh, is the fact that, for instance, China, you mentioned China. Uh, I don't know if it is really very convincing, but uh, the big change, I guess, in Biden's approach to China won't be the substance, but will be uh, the method. I'm sure that Biden will try to engage the European allies, and not only the European allies, but also Japan and others, in trying to organize a, a common, shared, large Western, or more than Western, because I think they will try, he will try to engage also countries that are not Western country countries in, in traditional way to um, share some ideas on how to deal with China. That is a big difference with Trump because Trump just decided his own approach to China. And it was China, US, stop. The rest of the world doesn't exist. And the, other, the only point was then, but too late, to try to say to the Europeans, for instance, to say you have to do it or you have to behave on some subjects. That was not enough. Um, this is why I think, for instance, uh, one consequence will be that Biden will try to revitalize places like the G7. G7 today is a, is a, can be a very interesting place because G7 today is without Russia, so is a is the only place in the world where Japan, Europe, and uh, North America, and uh, US and Canada can talk about topics where this part of the world shares uh, democracy, values, accountability, human rights, and so on and so forth. 
uh, and, and it is absolutely necessary to, to share and to define a common position towards China. So this is one example that I would like to, to raise on this point. But if I think on the four years of Trump, my point, for instance, is related to the fact that we all underestimated the impact of someone like Trump at the White House. I link the two aspects because Trump was someone unique in his behaviors, ideas, really unique and revolutionary in some terms. But I think we underestimated the fact that this revolution was at the White House. So he had, uh, he was very strong in the capacity the, to, to, to lead, to run, to influence Europe and the rest of the world because of the megaphone, if I can use this term, the eco effect of the White House. And this is why I am a little bit less worried now on the future about Trump, because Trump out of the White House is a completely different story. Yes, he will say uh, crazy things or very strong or very tough, but without the White House tools. So the, the attention from the rest of the world to what he is saying with the idea that uh, is there a consequence in terms of concrete aspects with, I don't know, uh, security, nuclear protectionism, because of course the president of the US has many tools. Uh, so without these tools and without this megaphone or without this eco, I think uh, his capacity to be influencing the rest of the world would be very low. And at the same time, what happened in the last four years, uh, in my view, it was uh, the most important part related to Europe was the fact, for instance, that he was very good in legitimizing and pushing, boosting, helping, in my view, the worst behaviors, discourses, um, populist approaches without any scientific evidence and, and the, the mask for instance, topic, uh, it would have been a completely different story without him at the White House. It was so easy for many populist leaders around Europe to say, okay, but listen, there's no evidence, no scientific evidence. Even the president of the US doesn't wear a mask. So what, what are you telling? So uh, I think this is a big change. And uh, of course, the other point about Biden is that uh, um, this big challenge coming from China and coming from Hanoi, from ASEAN, obliged him to immediately think a strategy on these topics. And it is not easy, uh, to say very frankly. Uh, not easy for one very simple reason. Uh, the large part of the voters, even the voters, the democratic and progressive voters, progressive voters, both in the US and in Europe, are not very happy today with free trade. Free trade is becoming more and more a divisive topic. So free trade is not a positive religion. And uh, so the key point is, how can we invent something to challenge what, or to be competitive with what in Asia they are doing, knowing that there's a problem at home with these topics. And this is, I think, the key issue today for Biden, to think, to invent with, with us, with Europeans, and to try to be very uh, effective and very with, with a good narrative, but also, again, with this link with being effective, effective for and concrete, positive, useful for day-by-day day life. You know, we have the example in Europe in this very period. The, the image of Europe, of the European Union, was very bad some months ago. Today, the image of Europe is uh, better and better within European people and uh, also within the Southern European people. And why? Because of the effectiveness. 
because it, it was so clear that the European Union took fast decision, decisions very good uh, to uh, try to tackle um, the recession of the crisis. And, uh, and that was well received by the citizens. So this effectiveness, be concrete, be useful for use, normal life. This is why this index that I mentioned at the very beginning can be for me a good tool for the narrative. Thank you. I, I have one comment and then the last question. And of course, we, I wish we could go on for, for longer. One comment, to, uh, which I, mean, I think President Trump was both, uh, as many have commented, a symptom, but also an accelerator of these trends. And having the megaphone of the White House, as you said, gave it a legitimacy to, to, to feelings that were more diffuse. But he had four years to, to, to push them from the sort of the, the ecosystem of the outside into uh, the, the inside. And again, the next four years, he will continue or others will continue. And it's going to be very much up to, 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 to President Biden to see whether through his actions he could counter it by making the benefits of a different worldview more concrete. Um, which brings me to the uh, one of the questions which I think it, it lies uh, at the core of, of the challenge of the next four years. The pandemic was one transnational threat. There's another one which has been with us for some time and which presents the same sort of push-pull issue of what are the what are the concrete benefits, what are the abstract benefits, and that's climate change. And in the last weeks of the campaign, as you may know here, President uh, Trump made a huge push based on, on, on then Vice President Biden's talk about uh, phasing out fossil fuel, phasing out uh, fracking, taking steps which to many people in some states were viewed as threatening their economic livelihood for the sake of a long-term good, which is fighting climate change, which some people don't understand. That is the real existential threat of the long term. What does that tell you in terms of how, not just Biden, but people in Europe need to address the issue of climate change in terms of cooperation with China, in terms of taking steps that are going to, 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 to prepare ourselves without opening up the uh, space for populists and others to say, why should we hurt our own economies for the sake of this abstract fear of climate change when countries like China are not taking the same steps and they are trying to take advantage economically. What lessons can you learn from the way we've dealt with the pandemic to deal with the issue of climate change in a multilateral setting, perhaps better than we've dealt with the pandemic? You know, your point brings me to think of the fantastic movement of Fridays for Future that we had before the pandemic. Um, I. I would like to refer to this movement because it was uh, the first time that we had since many, many decades uh, a fantastic, great participation, engagement uh, of the young generation. And I think at the end of the day, this crucial point of youth and young generation is today the, the key point of our societies. And I link it, of course, to um, sustainability and to, uh, in Europe, the Green Deal and, and, and so on, because uh, it is the way to, to be engaged with a mission for the future, but at the same time, it's also a way for the rest of our society to think a little bit uh, to the role and to the destiny of youth. If I uh, give a look to the numbers, to the figures in Europe, it's unbelievable what is happening. Uh, youth is, uh, is, a, is a minority in our societies, is a minority um, having under the, the attack of two crises in the same generation, because we had for uh, within 10 years, two crises attacking the same people or partially the same people, uh, creating a lot of anxieties for their future, creating instability for their future. Uh, and at the same time, the gap that I mentioned before is wider and wider when we talk on uh, around youth. I was shocked by uh, uh, listening and, and uh, reading a, a, a poll by Ipsos on youth in France and Italy. And you have similar uh, figures, similar numbers for, for instance, one 
point, and the point that, that, that shocked me the most, and the point was, did you have any experience abroad, out of your country? Any experience means uh, a, a part of your studies or a stage or, um, of course, an Erasmus or something uh, out of your country. Uh, young people uh, from uh, 18 to 35. And in both countries, 30% um, had this experience and two thirds didn't. And I was shocked because at the end of the day in countries like Italy and France, and I'm, I'm not talking Nevada and Arizona, I'm, I'm talking Italy and France, so countries so close to each other uh, at the very center of any exchange you have, still today in this period, you have two thirds of youth without any chance to uh, go in another country to spend a part of, uh, um, of, of the education in another country or even a, a small piece of uh, activity in another country. So if you experience only what is happening at home in your country, dealing with people talking your same language and with your same symptoms, idioms, and uh, attitudes, at the end of the day, uh, you continue to think that the others are foreigners, even if they are French or they are Italians or I don't know. Um, so I think there's an enormous, uh, I would say, um, we have to fulfill uh, their with, with new ideas on how to, to push in the direction. I think education is at the end of the day, the core of everything what we <laughs> discussed this afternoon or this, this morning. Uh, it is education at the end of the day. And uh, so we have to think on how boosting and how to change this direction and how to avoid this gap widening and how to extend, uh, I would say, education that can allow you to be open to, to, to the others, not close to the others, thinking that the exchange with someone else is a positive thing for you and not a negative thing. And uh, so I, I think youth at the end of the day is the, is the answer to your final question. And uh, uh, because, because they, they showed us that they will fight for climate uh, in the future, they will fight for environment, and uh, we have to help them to fight because it is in our own interest. Thank you. I think it's a great note on which to end. Thank you, Prime Minister. I know that uh, we need to move on. I wish we could continue, but thank you so much, and Gian Piero. Uh, I think it's 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 the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Enrico Letta and to Robert Malley. Uh, for to Enrico for his remarks and to Robert for having let such a bright conversation taking the best out of our speaker. And I will, I will now give the floor for a comment and a concluding word to Secretary Di Carlo and then to Ambassador Zappia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm really pleased to be able to be here. I've been asked to just uh, kick off a discussion uh, on multilateralism as a response to crises in the Mediterranean, tell you a little bit about what the UN is doing. Um, well, whether we look at Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Cyprus, or the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, we see crises today that are multifaceted and have regional and global implications. They're also in some ways interconnected and draw a multitude of different actors and interests. COVID-19 pandemic has further exposed the fragilities of the Mediterranean region. Virus has overwhelmed health systems in Libya, Lebanon, and Syria, further exacerbating their existing challenges. Now, the UN, as you know, is engaged in the Mediterranean region. We've been aiming to foster dialogue by convening relevant actors in certain settings uh, and providing humanitarian assistance and development assistance as well. We've seen important progress in Libya. We're cautiously optimistic. 
Uh, the Libyan parties are operationalizing the 23 October ceasefire agreement and are engaging in political negotiations to forge a new era of peace and stability. And it's clear that most Libyans wish to find a peaceful solution after almost 10 years of protracted crisis. It's vital that we all continue to fully support them. But this is only gonna be possible if violations of the UN Security Council arms embargo cease. And all stakeholders of the Berlin process fully adhere to the commitments made in Berlin last January. In Syria, the impact of nearly a decade of conflict, corruption, accelerating economic decline has pushed Syrians ever closer to a breaking point. And successive UN envoys have worked with Syrian parties and their backers at the regional and global level to facilitate a political solution to the conflict. Now, the latest manifestation of these efforts is the Syrian Constitutional Committee. And uh, key players, key international actors included, including Security Council, Astana Group, a small group, came together. And without their backing, the holding of uh, meetings of such a committee would not have been possible. But we all know that this is one small part of what's going to be needed in Syria in order to move forward uh, to a peaceful and prosperous Syria, uh, country for the Syrian people. Uh, Lebanon, combined political, socioeconomic, and health crisis has pushed Lebanon almost to the brink. Uh, following the tragic 4 August explosion, a strong and sustained international response is critical to help the country address the multitude of challenges it faces. And we all need to urge Lebanon's leaders, including Prime Minister designate Saad Hariri, to redouble their efforts to form a government that can implement the reforms necessary to move Lebanon on the path to recovery. And we need to champion the primacy of the state in security and international relations. Regarding the Middle East peace process, the UN has continued its diplomatic efforts with the Middle East Quartet, key Arab partners, and Israeli and Palestinian leaders. We've urged Israelis and Palestinians to build upon recent developments in the region and re-engage in returning to the path of meaningful negotiations. And we remain concerned about unilateral actions on the ground, which continue to undermine the viability of the two-state solution. As tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean continue over hydrocarbon exploration and maritime border delimitations, the Secretary General has urged parties to avoid unilateral actions that could trigger tensions or undermine dialogue. This is especially important now as efforts are underway to revitalize the stall negotiation process in Cyprus. Tens of thousands of migrants and refugees have crossed the Mediterranean this year at great risk and several hundred have perished. While migration and refugee movements affect the entire Mediterranean region, multilateral cooperation and solidarity is often scarce. We need more cooperation on these issues to address the root causes of large migration and refugee movements and to identify and disband smuggling and trafficking networks operating in the Mediterranean Sea. Now to be effective, we need a multilateralism and multilateral efforts that are based on strong coordination and compromise among key partners. Obviously the Med Dialogue Forum raises critical questions about our collective capacity uh, to address the political, security, economic, environmental challenges face, uh, that are faced in the Mediterranean region. How we respond to these questions will determine in a large part whether we'll enjoy a future of sustained peace and security in the region. I will be really pleased to hear your views on this important topic. Uh, I know many of you have been working in this area very intensely for a number of years uh, and have uh, perspectives that we would certainly benefit from. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosemary. And uh, le let me uh, take this opportunity also to thank uh, Giampiero uh, Massolo, Rob Malley, and, uh, and even more uh, President Enrico Letta for a, a really interesting, rich, and thought-provoking uh, uh, conversation. My task here is, is to try to, uh, to, to make a transition from uh, 
um, a very uh, large analysis of where multilateralism uh, is today to uh, how to uh, build uh, a positive uh, dialogue, a positive narrative uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And I think, um, if I may, uh, from what Enrico Letta and, and Richard uh, Manley were, were saying at the very beginning, uh, I take also that we need to think of a multilateral system that is multi-stakeholders, where uh, new actors have to, uh, uh, to be taken into consideration, and I think the example of youth that uh, uh, Enrico made uh, is, uh, is very telling. Um, so a, a multilateral system that is a multi-stakeholder, uh, maybe a new uh, architecture uh, for, for the area we are looking at today more specifically, which is, which is the Middle East. And at the same time, what Rosemary was saying, a very... Um, a challenging uh, uh, scenario uh, with, uh, with many crises still ongoing, uh, uh, with some hope in some cases and, and, and in others still a solution uh, very, uh, very looming very far. Um, I think uh, one of our uh, tasks today is to try to see also what sort of positive agenda for, for the Middle East we can, uh, we can envisage. Uh, and I think in that respect, um, it's is nice to have a, a conversation now with uh, some of uh, the main actors uh, in the region, uh, starting from uh, uh, General Del Col, who's the head of mission and force commander of Unifil. So one very concrete example of how the, the system, the multilateral system and the UN are responding to some of those challenges. Uh, Christoph Eusgen, um, ambassador, permanent representative uh, of Germany uh, to the UN, um, a very close friend. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Christoph represents one uh, very important country, uh, certainly uh, for Europe, but for uh, at large for international relations. So Christoph has uh, been the um, uh, closest uh, uh, foreign policy advisor to uh, the Chancellor, uh, to Chancellor Merkel, uh, for, for many, many years. Um, so he's really well placed to uh, uh, bring the perspective of uh, a major important players um, on the international arena and also in the Middle East. And by the way, Germany is holding the presidency of the European Union right now in a very challenging uh, moment. Uh, Lana Nusebe, permanent representative of the uh, Emirates uh, in, uh, in the UN, uh, also a close friend, and, and Lana represents that uh, new uh, face uh, of, of a new Middle East that we want to, uh, to see. Uh, and, uh, and so we are looking forward to your, to your remark. And of course, the, the Emirates are at the center of one of the good new things that are happening in the region and they uh, which can also be the beginning of, of this uh, new positive agenda for the region. And then Claudia Gazzini, uh, uh, Claudia will bring us uh, uh, closer to uh, one of the major crises in the region, Libya, uh, where also there is uh, uh, some, there are some signs of, of hope uh, and, and maybe we can put this piece also um, in the perspective that we want to give today of a positive agenda for, for uh, uh, the Middle East and uh, the Mediterranean region. Uh, the conversation will be moderated by Richard um, Gowen of, uh, uh, of the International Crisis Group. And I want to thank again uh, the International Crisis Group for being such a good partner together with ISP in, uh, in this conversation. So thank you very much. And I, I, I'll give the floor now for our second uh, panel, Healing the Mediterranean, uh, rethinking security in post-pandemic times uh, to General uh, Del Col, uh, Force Commander of Unifield. Yeah, here we are. <clears throat> um, the, first of all, let me thank uh, the permanent representative, the permanent mission of Italy, sorry, and, uh, and the National Crisis Group and the ESP, ESP for organizing this uh, time event <clears throat> on the um, multilateral, but also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the region. Um, well, let me say and start that uh, 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 considering the, uh, why the COVID pandemic uh, uh, 
is first and foremost a health crisis. Uh, its implications are, are much more far-reaching. Um, so we are living in, in, a, in, a, in a, a situation where the, uh, day by day we have to deal with the, 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 the COVID the pandemic. And uh, the pandemic has a, had a severe uh, social and economic impact. It has deep in, in existing inequality, including gender inequality, and also pose a significant uh, threat to the, uh, the maintenance of the international peace and security. Uh, right from the start, uh, the UN uh, uh, had called for the uh, international coordination, uh, unity, solidarity to address uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, however, uh, the, uh, here so far has shown that in some countries, uh, the pandemic has a lead uh, to political uh, polarization and thus uh, disunity and instability. The pandemic uh, uh, struck the Middle East uh, that was already stressed by overlapping uh, political, economic, social, uh, security, humanitarian crisis. Uh, considering uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, the effect of the pandemic uh, on a region characterized by instability, like where we are operating uh, uh, in the Middle East, they are really concerned about how the region will maintain stability against uh, the uh, uh, multiple crises. Uh, the pandemic long term, uh, the impact of the, uh, the pandemic uh, will also uh, add to the region a already long list of structural challenges. In Lebanon, uh, the pandemic uh, has exasperated uh, an already catastrophic economic crisis and ongoing political paralysis. Uh, perhaps more than uh, uh, anywhere else in the world, uh, Lebanon is facing uh, an intense and even contradictory pressure resulting from the need to protect the public health and promote economy recovery while ensuring political stability. As you know, uh, in the Saad <coughs> really is a, is a designated to form the government uh, uh, but uh, uh, so we are waiting a positive answer for that. Uh, also, was raised uh, three days ago in Security Council by my colleagues in, in Kubish, uh, and uh, uh, how the, uh, we are uh, uh, wishing the uh, political stability rather than the instability here in, in Lebanon. Um, recently, in the, on the 23rd of March, the Secretary General issued an appeal for immediate uh, universal ceasefire uh, to reinforce the diplomatic action help create, as we say, the condition to deliver the, uh, the life-saving aid and bring hope uh, to places uh, that uh, were uh, all, uh, amongst the most vulnerable uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this call has mostly fallen on deep earth uh, in the MENA region. And for my part, I wrote on both parties in Israel and, and Lebanon. I understand, I understand uh, the call to Lebanon and Israel again uh, to the following the, 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 the appeal. Uh, and despite the shooting messaging in the beginning, uh, this year continue to see uh, uh, high high of rhetoric from the parties and several incidents along the blue line. Just to remind you, the blue line is not a border. Is the line was defined by the UN in 2000 and, uh, uh, and assessed that the Israeli withdrawal the forces uh, and, uh, in 2000. Uh, UN remain uh, the international uh, community best hope uh, uh, to mitigate the normalization of instability in the region. For instance, just to give an example, uh, uh, the peacekeeping operation that I lead uh, the UN interim force in Lebanon uh, and the economy is unifil uh, continue to probe uh, then even uh, in a region that is a heavily militarized uh, like the Middle East, a peace operation can contribute to uh, stabilizing the situation. And we are doing that uh, after 2006 uh, of Amin that have been uh, uh, doing the, the, in, the, in the same way for 14 years. Uh, uh, the, the functioning of a liaison and coordination mechanism or arrangement, including the tripartite uh, uh, 
uh, mechanism that the mission, the mission put in place uh, uh, underlined the importance of uh, uh, UN uh, peace operation uh, in managing uh, uh, a potential uh, disaster situation. So let me uh, explain. Uh, while the work of uh, our peacekeepers undertaken uh, uh, is essentially at the tactical level, we are doing a, uh, 450 activities per day uh, with our 11,000 soldiers. Uh, it's a unique, unique UN mission that also have the maritime task force, and they take the opportunity uh, uh, to thank uh, uh, Germany because it will be the next uh, uh, maritime task force leader. Uh, uh, but the consequence of that is could be escalated at the, at the political level in a while. So the impl implication for a an incident across the blue line between Hezbollah and uh, Israel can immediately and easily escalate far behind the, the blue line or the Golan area and, and trigger events across the whole the Middle East. Uh, uh, this is uh, what I mean uh, by managing a potential disaster situation, the nightmare scenario of uh, an uh, accidental war. So why is true that uh, the, the pandemic has had a uh, a further layer of complexity of this task of managing a fragile cessation of hostilities, the, our liaison and coordination mechanism between the two parties remain active and are used by the, the party as a crucial tool uh, to diffuse attention. A strict movement restriction were implemented uh, by both Lebanon and Israel uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and my engagement with the party continued uh, without interrupting using other system. As we say, uh, two days ago, we had a, a, a Security Council meet, uh, meeting uh, on the SG report implementation 1701 uh, using uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Teams. So we use the technology to uh, keep in touch between us. Uh, and uh, uh, so we are uh, continuing monitoring uh, uh, and diffuse attention at the, at the uh, sub tactical uh, level on both sides of the blue line. So, removed from uh, the uh, public view, and often is strong uh, uh, contrast uh, with the public uh, posturing, there is a, a reality of the channels of tactical communication that we establish. Uh, day by day out, uh, and this is the uh, trial character uh, unified critical role in preserving the situation of hostilities. Uh, the parties also ha uh, have not disengaged and continue with the, uh, the meetings uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, we continue uh, uh, um, doing the, uh, the tripartite uh, um, uh, meetings uh, every seven, seven uh, uh, weeks. Uh, so this show that when uh, there is a, a consent of parties to have and use a, a mechanism uh, that are put in place, a peace operation are relevant and can deliver. Uh, that has not changed with this uh, pandemic and the continued volatile, uh, uh, volatility sorry, of the situation along the blue line, the flare up of the incidents and several breaks of the situation of hostility uh, with a serious potential of uh, unintended escalation. Uh, show the importance of this mechanism uh, through the United Nations, not only for both countries involved, but also for regional uh, peace and security. So the United Nations remain a pivotal uh, actor on the ground, in spite of many challenges uh, posted, uh, uh, posed by the current international environment. So let me stop uh, uh, here, and I'm asking if it's, uh, is it's possible, I want to show you one uh, 55 second uh, 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 movie on the unifil. Thank you.
Thank you very much, General. Um, and I think very good to see some images um, from your work on the ground as well. Um, a reminder that while we discuss multilateralism um, often as a, a grand concept, it is actually something um, that is realized operationally in practice and with risks um, for many of those uh, working on behalf of the UN. Um, I'm going to follow the order the ambassador suggested, so I'm delighted to turn next to uh, Christoph Heusgen, um, ambassador of Germany, who I think will focus uh, on another situation in the region that USG Di Carlo highlighted, which is Libya. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Richard, but let me first tribute to my friend Mariangela. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here together with her. We worked together already when she was a diplomatic advisor in, in Italy, but contrary to me, she served uh, three prime ministers, Renzi and Gentiloni and, and Conti, and it's wonderful now to, to work with her here. And indeed, I want like to, to concentrate on Libya, because Libya is somehow haunting us uh, um, while we are in the Security Council, um, 10 years ago or nine years ago, 2011, uh, the decision in the Security Council was on the table, how, what do we do about the uh, possible military intervention at the time? Um, the Chancellor decided um, to abstain um, when it came to the question, um, do we um, do we support this military intervention? Because um, her question was res pizza fine. What what will happen in the end? And do we have a do we have an exit? And um, um, we were criticized at the time a lot for for um, this reluctance. Um, but it gave us a lot of credibility on on many sides. And uh, um, so um, um, we have been we have remained uh, very active on the file and uh, talking about haunting. Um, again, when we had uh, the presidency in the Security Council in April 2014, um, we again had Libya on our agenda. You may recall that at the time, the Secretary General and uh, Hassan uh, Salame um, were trying to push through their peace plan. Um, and um, in April, it was uh, when they were actually active. They were in the region when then General Haftar um, uh, decided to start his offensive. And um, we were in Security Council and uh, I was the chair and tried to, to have the Security Council react to it and um, um, at least adopt a, a press a press elements. And uh, at that time, it was our um, US friends who, who vetoed it because um, um, the White House was, um, at least for some time, uh, supporting General Haftar. And, uh, um, that was, of course, deeply um, frustrating, um, and uh, the crisis continued. And then we continued to get pressure as Germany. Um, Salami went public and said, "Germany, um, you are the the uh, you chair the sanctions committee in the Security Council. You have to do something about the situation. And Germany has to assume responsibility." So, and this is when we then started to work very closely with uh, Hassan uh, Salami. Um, the Berlin conference was mentioned, it was more the Berlin um, process. Um, Germany said, okay, um, if Hassan Salame asks us um, and he wants Germany to be um, active, also um, looking back at our, our history on, on Libya, we said, okay, let's try to, to support this. And um, we um, then prepared um, very painstakingly the, um, the Berlin um, conference um, and um, I don't want to go into detail, but um, the Berlin Conference brought all the actors, um, all the outside actors together. And we had the result of the Berlin Conference, which was endorsed then by the Security Council. And we are still working very hard today. And I want to um, pay tribute to Stephanie Williams, who has done a remarkable job after Hassan Salami um, was frustrated and, and um, also had um, then health reasons to step down and she has done a, a fantastic way to bring this process forward. We have been um, continuing to be very um, active in the follow-up committee, in the working groups, but for us it is very important to give the lead to the UN and have the UN in the forefront and, and um, have deal, deal with the issue. And, and we hope that this will um, continue. Stephanie Williams has done uh, enormous progress. We have a calendar now 
Um, of course, it has to be filled, this calendar has to be filled in substance. There has to be an agreement on who will be the um, head of government. And this, of course, will be, will be difficult. Coming to the second part of it, um, our task, and this is where Hassan Salami said, you are the head of the sanctions committee and um, you have to show some teeth. And uh, um, we have been trying to do this. Um, we, um, 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 you, you listen to what Rosemary Di Carlo said at the beginning in her very short intervention on, um, on Libya, you see it, how important it is that the um, arms embargo is observed. And there, um, I must say, this is one of the most frustrating parts of our job here, that um, although it's, it's, it's openly, it's open, it is in the, um, um, it's public in the reports of the, um, of the panel of experts, um, uh, outside forces are still, are still, um, uh, putting weapons into, at least there were putting weapons into um, into into the, the country. And maybe um, Lana would like to say something about the U United Arab Emirates, who are um, named in the um, uh, panel of experts report. There is uh, Turkey delivering and not even hiding it. There is uh, there are other countries mentioned. And we hear the reports about Russia sending their mercenaries, their Wagner group there. I've been raising this again and again in the, in the Security Council. So outside actors have to uh, play ball um, and have to um, again, and we'll come back to the to what um, um, was the, the, the theme at the very beginning. We can only survive in this crisis and beyond if we are ready to support the multilateral approach. If we go by the rules-based order, this will this is the only way how I think mankind can survive. If if we don't do that, um, I think we are doomed. So back to you, Richard. I promise to be short. Thank you, Christoph. Um, as, as someone who, as a job, uh, spends his time being rude about the Security Council, um, I always feel you do it much better than me uh, from the inside. Um, Lana, over uh, um, over to you. Um, Christoph did raise one question for you, but I was also keen to hear your views on one of the glimmers of hope that I think we have um, witnessed in the Middle East in recent months, which is the Abraham Accords and um, the arrest the creation of relations between Israel and the UAE. So uh, give us a glimmer of hope. Thank you so much, Richard. I will try to give everyone a glimmer of hope in this uh, very cold, chilly New York uh, morning. Uh, I'd rather we were in the warmer climes of Rome, of course. Um, but let me first of all thank the International uh, Institute, the Institute for International Political Studies, the International Crisis Group, and of course, our dear friend, Ambassador Mariangela Sapia for inviting me to these Mediterranean dialogues. Uh, and I think that the, um, the conversation is already incredibly stimulating. Um, Christoph spoke about situations that haunted, uh, haunt us on the Security Council in our region. And I think that's a very apt description. Uh, when you think about it, uh, actually in 2013, it was Europeans, uh, others, the United States that urged the United Arab Emirates to join the NATO coalition at the time uh, and said this was really, really important for the future stability uh, of Libya. And so, of course, it's very difficult when you come into a situation uh, like Libya um, to, to then press green and then press red and, uh, you know, be a front line against terrorism and extremism there, be a front line in, in preventing uh, what is a very resource rich country becoming a breeding ground for terrorist activities in the region. Uh, and of course, the human suffering that we saw there and the human cost was incredibly high. Um, so I think it's it's clear that uh, there is a glimmer of political hope in Libya. Uh, we are very supportive uh, of that glimmer. Um, we're very supportive of the processes that have been launched, the 23rd October agreement, uh, the Berlin uh, processes and all its tracks. Uh, and we continue to be very supportive in that work. We think there needs to be a continuation and a buildup of the political dialogue. Uh, of course, uh, and also that everyone has to abide by the terms of the agreement. Everyone has to cease bringing uh, equipment and military uh, apparatus into Libya, including Turkey. And I think that it is really incumbent on the countries that have that influence on Turkey uh, to make sure that it doesn't uh, do what it has said uh, after the signing of the agreement, which is disregarded essentially and continue to bring in uh, Syrian mercenaries on the ground, because um, I think that is really the destabilizing factor there. But I think if everyone complies, we really do have my echo 
uh, what has been said about the excellent work of the UN in this regard and the SRSG, Stephanie Williams, the acting SRSG, because I think it's been tremendous work. It is a glimmer of hope uh, and we should build on it. So I'll, I'll stop on Libya and we can go into it a little more if people want to, but I'd like to focus on the other glimmer of hope in our region that I do think is important. I'd like to share today, um, and I think this could be relevant, of course, to the frozen conflicts in some parts of our region, um, the need for these new approaches to resolve conflicts in the region so that they don't continue to haunt us. And that's really moving us from conflict uh, management mode to conflict resolution as a paradigm for the region. And I think the Abraham Accords really fits into that uh, new paradigm, that new way of thinking between the UAE and Israel. And it actually provides a really interesting example of what can happen when we decide to break from some of these political dynamics uh, that have unfortunately framed the MENA region for decades. So I'd like to say three short things about the Abraham Accords and then share three thoughts maybe that can be applied to other regional conflicts from how we approach the Abraham Accords. Um, and the first thing that I really want to mention is that this agreement is about creating a warm peace. And often that's very lacking in some of the processes that we see in other parts of the region, which are still very conflictual and hostile. But this is about creating a warm peace between two forward-looking, dynamic, ambitious countries in the Middle East who have an agenda on climate change, who have an agenda on gender and empowerment, who have an agenda on youth uh, and their empowerment in the region. Uh, and there's been so much speculation uh, about how this agreement might seek to counterbalance, um, to counterbalance other um, agreements in the, in the region and other issues. Um, so I think that this is, this is the first thing that I wanted to mention. But it's, it, it's about, not about anything else or anyone else. I think it's a sovereign decision by two countries um, that want to uh, develop, strengthen their relationship. It goes beyond recognition and the normalization of ties. Um, and it's about what people to people engagement can lead to. Uh, and so we've already seen promising announcements regarding cooperation on healthcare, uh, the fight against COVID-19, for example, water desalination, renewable energy, uh, to name just a few areas. So all very much in the glimmer of hope uh, category, Richard. Um, secondly, one of the keys to unlocking this agreement was that we decided to focus on the future and not the past. So for too long in this conflict, and by this I mean the wider uh, Arab approach uh, to Israel, countries in our region have really been hostages of history and unable to rewrite uh, chapters around what the future of the region could look like. And that history is very much a history of two things, lost opportunities and facts on the ground, which limit our political options. And I think that's the lesson we, we drew from the past 75 years or so of negotiations around this issue. So our objective in taking this diplomatic and pragmatic approach is to open communication channels with Israel and to be helpful in contributing to a sustainable solution to the conflict. Um, and in our view, uh, our, our um, diplomatic agreement between the UAE and Israel is in fact a win-win for the whole region, not only for these two countries, and in particular for our youth, given the economic opportunities that it opens up. So we can't continue to focus on what we have not been able to achieve in the past 100 years. We need to prioritize what we can achieve in the next 100 years uh, and create those opportunities uh, for all. And I, the final thing I'd, I'd really like to mention on the agreement is that it does have the potential, we believe, to lower tensions in the region and create some of this new energy for positive change. So it halted annexation in the agreement, maintained the viability of the two-state solution, uh, and created more space and time for renewed efforts to advance the peace process. Uh, and I don't have to reiterate here because I know this is well known in this audience, but we, of course, maintain our steadfast support to the Palestinian people uh, and the two-state solution. Uh, and we continue to call for the establishment of the independent Palestinian state along the international uh, parameters and along international law that we all acknowledge. So how do we focus these um, shifts uh, on helpful uh, comparisons to how we look at other conflicts in the region? I think that's the second part of uh, some of the comments I'd like to make today. First of all, it's that in the Middle East and North Africa, we find ourselves in this conflict management framework uh, that I mentioned instead of a conflict resolution framework. So whether it's in violent conflicts or in those long-standing frozen conflict conflicts, there's really this lack of willingness to reach out to others, 
move the needle towards a peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, and diplomats around the world, including at the UN, unfortunately, and I think this is where I share Christoph's frustration sometimes, they focus on these process-oriented discussions um, instead of the big picture. How do we, how do we get to, from point A to point B in a, in a diplomatic solution? Um, but it's true that there have been positive developments recently. Um, so uh, like, for example, the ceasefire and the efforts to unify the petroleum facilities guards in Libya, um, but these core political issues remain unaddressed and we need to see that kind of bold strategic action, that bigger strategic vision that would place us in a conflict resolution paradigm as opposed to conflict management, as opposed to treading water. Second, I'd like to mention the shifting dynamics uh, in the international system that have been referenced in the first panel today, so excellently by, excellently by the former uh, PM of Italy and others and how that impacts our region from our perspective in terms of how we look at our own security needs and architecture. So could we, for example, today ever imagine uh, a replication of an American-led coalition operation uh, that would liberate, for example, Kuwait from occupation uh, with nearly a million foreign troops on uh, Arab soil? Could we ever imagine that happening in today's fragmented international environment? Uh, and so what does that tell us? What does that tell us when we look at the international environment, it tells us that everyone does in fact need to share the burden in defending the stability of the region and in promoting peace and security. So you can't rely exclusively on others uh, to, to lead in that process. And this is really um, even more heightened when you see that some countries are behaving in a very old uh, historic paradigm, in a, in a hegemonic, um, uh, imperial paradigm, the behavior of actors such as Turkey and Iran are what I'm referring to here, um, the funding and arming of terrorist groups, the spread of extremist ideology, uh, the foreign policy projections in the region through these militias. Uh, we don't have today the, this external security guarantor um, to address these destabilizing behaviors of these particular actors. And so for us, it means doubling down on multilateralism, doubling down on increasing international plus regional cooperation and seeing the two work together better to mitigate their impact. And third, and this is connected to um, the point that I just raised, which is that our security is interconnected and we need to be inclusive in how we approach uh, peaceful settlements of conflicts. And I think COVID-19 has demonstrated that um, firmly. Uh, I think, for example, the role that Germany has played and other countries in regard to Libya has been particularly helpful um, in making sure that regional states come together uh, and work towards peace, that the actors are all around the table. Uh, and there have been a, a long history of similar arrangements in the past. I remember in the 90s, we saw this emergence of groups of friends, these informal groups of states uh, who formed to support the peacemaking of the United Nations and to address some of the thorniest issues in front of the Security Council. And I spent much time in the Afghanistan version of that. So in this increasingly polarized world, uh, maybe a revitalized constellation of groups of friends can contribute uh, to the pursuit of political solution and provide a bulwark supporting the UN in this approach. Um, but I think ultimately the absence of a ultimate security guarantor in the MENA region um, makes it more and more necessary to promote convergence and this perspective of shared interests. And not only among active parties to particular conflict, but also among those concerned with the overall trajectory of conflicts in the region um, and where we want to end up. So, you know, looking at everything through the lens of uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, question, for example, which is where does this end and, you know, what is what is the outcome in the end? So in conclusion, we need a change of paradigm. We need to acknowledge that political dynamics in the region are also shifting uh, and that we have a perspective to offer and to share about our own region uh, that should be usefully added to the discussion. We need that additional burden sharing and we're cognizant of that. We need all relevant stakeholders to be involved uh, around the table in the pursuit of these political solutions. And I think the conflicts of the 21st century have been this powerful reminder that there is no hard and fast division between MENA and Europe, uh, and rather that there's this interconnected Mediterranean world um, even for those of us physically far from the Mare Nostrum. So our approaches and solutions must reflect that, re that reality uh, if we're to have any hope of securing peace for now. I think how we all view it, which is that it's our shared region. 
So Richard, let me stop here and, and thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Lana. Um, we are actually already pressing up to our, our time limit and uh, unfortunately, Ambassador Hoiskin had to uh, um, had to leave us, but I think we've just got time uh, if we run over a little bit for um, an intervention by my my colleague Claudia Gazzini, um, uh, the senior Libya analyst for the International Crisis Group, who I think can draw some of the threads together, um, talking about how UN peacemaking is working in the Mediterranean. And uh, Claudia is herself a former advisor to um, UN mediators in Libya. So Claudia. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you to those who uh, who were speaking before me, because essentially what came out was uh, uh, two options for Libya ahead, whether on the one side it will continue to haunt you for the years to come, or whether it will become this glimmer of hope that we all hope uh, it will be. Um, and I think the answer to whether it'll go down one way or the other depends on three main factors. One is, of course, how the UN and the UN mission and the next UN envoy manages a process that so far has given us good reasons to, to, to be hopeful. We've seen a ceasefire being signed. We've seen a war, a dramatic war on Tripoli end after 15 months of combat. And we've seen a, the kickstart of a political process. So how the UN continues to adapt to the changing circumstances will be uh, important. And I want to underscore this idea of adapting to the changing circumstances because the UN has over the years adapted and changed its approach to Libya. Let's not forget that after the 2011 war, this mission, the UNSMIL mission was essentially a political mission uh, in, tasked with supporting the authorities in Libya with reforming their institutions and paving the way to a democratic process. But UNSMIL over the years has changed. It's taken on greater tasks. It has had to look more into security sector. Um, and that meant in 2015, uh, you know, the military coordinator actually reaching out to armed groups in Tripoli and sort of creating what was at the time sort of a green zone. This wasn't really part of its original mandate. UNSMIL has also taken on the burden of looking into the economic and the, and the financial side of the, of the crisis. Uh, so for this reason, we saw under Ghassan Salam is sort of a, really a new track, an economic track uh, being open. And thirdly, UNSMO has also adapted because it has come to terms with the changing reality uh, of the conflict, whereby we've, we've seen over the years greater involvement of foreign powers, greater internationalization of the conflict, which led to this format, which is this Berlin uh, process, which is essentially a consultation process, ongoing consultation process between foreign actors. So, um, Adaptability is, is essential in, in a very uh, rapidly evolving uh, scenario. The second factor that will determine whether or not um, um, the, the peace process in Libya goes down the positive road or the haunting road will, be, um, will depend on whether the, these three tracks that I outlined, the military, the economic, and the political, actually progress. Uh, because what we've seen over the years is, you know, a little progress in one and then it sort of bogs down, a little progress on the other and then it bogs down. So there is a realization and there is an acknowledgement by all parties, including uh, the envoys and the foreign parties, that Libya really does need this three track process but they need to proceed simultaneously and back each other. And we haven't seen that happening really that often. So where we're at now, for example, is good progress on the military side of things. So, you know, we're all cheering the fact that there has been the ceasefire agreement, um, even though the implementation of it will be difficult, but we haven't seen for quite some time any real progress on the issue of unifying the economic institutions, reforming the central bank. Uh, we've seen the oil taps reopen, but the institutional problems of unification of the economic and financial institutions haven't really moved forward. And same, and I think when, when we turn to the political uh, side of the equation as well, we're seeing a little bit of progress now because delegates across Libya have been convening, but is this substantial process, uh, progress, sorry, 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that we've really made a breakthrough in these uh, political talks. And what, what is needed now is, is really a serious breakthrough. Uh, what does that breakthrough look like? Of course, the question now on everybody's mind is whether the next step in Libya should be a government of national unity. And as you remember, this new process, this new political process that Stephanie Williams started uh, in this last round of the Tunis dialogue is aimed essentially at bringing about, creating a new government of national unity, a new presidency council that is supposed to replace the one of uh, headed by Fayez Siraj and bring together this institutional unification of the country. Well, it didn't produce that. The Tunis, the one week Tunis dialogue didn't produce a new government. And I would say, I doubt it will produce a new government uh, because of various factors. One is that since 20, you know, since 2016, when we, when we, the UN started to, to, to try to promote a dialogue process aimed at uh, reconfiguring the executive authority in Libya, they've failed. All these successive attempts, different formats have failed. They've failed because there are competing visions of who they want to see encrowned in this process, who you want to see coming to power. And these competing visions, visions of who should come to power in Libya are reflective of the heart of the conflict, the, 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 I say, the main uh, dividing lines that cross Libyan actors and cross international actors. And that is essentially, th these divisions rotate around the question of what does really constitute peace, the path towards peace and stability in Libya, uh, sort of the era of peace and stability as Rosemary uh, Di Carlo earlier mentioned. Libya and foreign actors are divided along two, two main lines. One that thinks that the path towards peace and stability is by embracing the rival authorities and the military command uh, led by uh, General Haftar and that faction and bringing them together under one. Okay, And those that think that taking that step meaning bringing the Tripoli based authorities and the Eastern based ones and the two military coalitions together and the rival economic institutions, doing that and making that leap of faith is a recipe for disaster. Just an hour ago, we heard, I was on another conference where a Turkish defense minister said, peace and stability in Libya can only be achieved if Haftar is marginalized and if the external actors supporting him stop supporting him. So really Libya, depends on how the future of Libya depends on whether you adhere to one vision or, or the other. The answer uh, is, the, is the, where you stand uh, paves the way for a unified Libya where the past is set behind us, meaning the war is ended and the fractions and the, and, and, and the feud that has given rise to this war is put behind us and people move forward or the other path where there's still resistance, resistance to move forward towards institutional unification. Um, I, I think that we will not achieve a government of national unity because of this tension. And therefore, perhaps the way to go, the way forward to go is to not try to invest days and months and weeks and dialogues in trying to negotiate this government, but just putting full uh, forward, putting all the energy into the electoral roadmap, which to me is the only basis for a real restart of the crisis of legitimacy that has undermined Libya for the past five years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, I think we've uh, gone into great depth in a very short period of time on a number of uh, situations in the region deserving uh, constant attention from the UN. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't continue the conversation, but I think we have uh, probably overshot our, our time limit as, as far as we can. So let me thank the General, um, let me thank uh, Ambassador Nutebe and, and Claudia for those contributions, I think for giving a lot of food for thought for the upcoming Med Dialogue main session in, in Rome. And now I hand back to uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Zapier to wrap up.
Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for the moderation of this very interesting panel. Uh, thank you all uh, from the very beginning of this conversation. And I just want to end with a few thoughts. Uh, Lana said very, very um, rightly that our security is interconnected. And I think the, the MENA region is really uh, maybe the region in the world where this is um, most visible. Uh, our security is indeed connected, uh, the, the European uh, security, uh, the MENA region security and the world security is connected in that area. Um, uh, from, from what um, uh, General Del Col and Rosemary Di Carlo said, uh, we need the UN uh, because also because the, our security is interconnected there. And so we need UNIFIL, we need what uh, uh, Unzmil is doing and, and Stephanie Williams is doing in Libya. We need all that. Um, we need to stick to our commitment, and, and I think this is, was a little bit the message that maybe uh, Christoph Oisgen was giving us, and at the same time, uh, we need to build trust. Uh, and I remember, Lana, a, a recent conversation uh, between yourself and the Secretary General, and I think this was one of the main messages that he, ga he gave. Um, the lack of trust is certainly uh, one main uh, problem that we have there. And I hope also this conversation uh, was a way to, uh, you know, to build that trust uh, which, which we need. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all again and uh, good luck for the Med Dialogues in, uh, in a week or so. Thank you. Thank you, Madam.